Well, it is good to be back in Pensacola, Florida. My wife and I just recently spent some time away in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. And I will tell you, I've never been so excited to see 30 degree weather on the forecast. Never in my life. When we were in Steamboat, or when we were looking forward to going to Steamboat, we were looking at the forecast to see what the weather would be like, because obviously we knew it was going to be a little colder than here. And uh, we saw that it was predicted to get down to lows of somewhere between zero and five degrees. And uh, you got to understand, Kenzie and I have lived in two places our life. We've lived in Georgia and we've lived in Florida. So that's not really conducive for cold weather. So we were already a little, uh, I don't want to say nervous, but we, we knew we were going to be cold. Let's just put it that way. Um, well, when we got there to make things even better, um, our phones at one time, we looked at our phone to see what the temperature was outside. Our phones registered that it was negative eight degrees at one point. And uh, so, so, yeah, to say that we were cold is an understatement. When we got back to the Pensacola airport and stepped outside and it was 35 degree weather, we were like, thank you, God, it is warm outside, right? I mean, we were, we were glad to be back. And uh, I'm so excited. I'll tell you one thing that Kenzie and I said over and over and over during our vacation is we really did miss our church. Uh, we missed you guys. We, we love you guys. We missed our college students. And I'm so glad to be back this morning. I believe God has a word. And I want to I say something. I don't know why you're in here. Um, I, I don't know what brought you here today. But I want you to know it's not an accident that you're in here today. Uh, I'm a very big believer in divine appointments, and I believe God has you in here for a specific reason. I believe he wants to speak directly to you. I think he has something for you today. It's just our job to listen to what he has. And so I want to encourage you this morning. God has something for you. Listen, listen this morning and see what he has to say. When Kenzie and I were preparing to get away, there's something that you got to understand about me. I am a planner, okay? You can ask any of my college students. They know I'm a planner. We just recently went on a winter retreat to Cincinnati, Ohio. We left at 6 a.m. in the morning to go to Cincinnati, Ohio for our winter retreat because we had a long drive ahead of us. And all of our college students were there on time, actually were there early, and we left early. You can ask any of our college students why. They know I'll leave them. <laughs> they know I'll leave them. Because when I put together a plan, I want to stick to my plan, right? I want, I want to know where I'm going. I want to know when I'm going. I want to know what I'm doing. I want to have everything mapped out. And so when we were getting ready for our vacation, I'm doing a lot of research. I know a lot of you are thinking, that does not sound like a vacation. Research for a vacation. But I, was, I wanted to know, you know, where we were going, what we were doing. I wanted to know details about the activity, about the place we were going. I wanted to know good places to eat. So I'm doing all kinds of research and looking up all kinds of different things, different activities that we can do. And as I was researching and as I was studying and looking at the place that we were going and the things we were going to do, on about every website that I went on, they all had this one page. And this one page was titled FAQ. You guys probably know what I'm talking about, right? FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions. Frequently Asked Questions. Every, every website had this Frequently Asked Questions page. And basically what this page was is it's we are so tired of people asking us the same questions over and over and over again. We are going to devote an entire page on our website to answering these questions so you will quit asking us. It's basically what a Frequently Asked Questions page is. And I spent a lot of time on the Frequently Asked Questions page trying to get as much information as I could and plan ahead as much as I could. And as I was studying for this morning, I got to thinking, what if there was a Frequently Asked Questions page in the Bible? What kind of questions would grace that page? Would there be questions about the gospel? Questions about the life of Jesus or who Jesus was? Would there be questions about the cross? Would there be questions about the resurrection? Would there be questions about creation? Like what kind of questions, what kind of topics would be covered on the frequently asked question page? And as I got to thinking about that, I became fairly confident that there would be at least this one topic on there. And it's the topic of prayer. <clears throat> prayer. I believe if there was a frequently asked questions page on the in the Bible, there would be a lot of questions about prayer. Because if we're being honest, prayer is like a fleeting concept. 
if we're being honest, we look at the Bible and we see things that we're supposed to do and things like reading the Bible, right? We can open the Bible, read the Bible, and we can tangibly know that we are reading the Bible, right? We can go to someone and we can share the gospel with them and we can say, hey, this is the good news about Jesus. And we know when we're sharing the gospel with somebody. We see in the Bible, the Bible says to do something, we can know if we're doing it. When the Bible says don't do something, we know when we're not doing it. But if we're being honest, when it comes to the topic of prayer, there's a lot of confusion. If a lot of us are being honest, our prayer life, we don't really know what it is. And there are a lot of questions that come up with the topic of prayer. But I need you to know something this morning. Prayer is essential. If we're going to live life as God has called us to, we have to have a life full of prayer. And so this morning, as we continue to talk about being revived, we're going to talk about, and I'm hopefully going to answer, some frequently asked questions on prayer. And my goal today is that you walk out of here knowing what prayer is and how you can have a prayer life as God has called you to. And so there's going to be five questions that we're going to ask and answer this morning. We're gonna ask the question, what is prayer? We're gonna ask the question, why should we pray? We're gonna ask the question, how should we pray? What should we pray? And when should we pray? And so when I was studying for this message, I want you to know that there's a lot of different passages in the Bible about prayer. Like you can open up the Bible and prayer is literally scattered everywhere. And so when we answer the first two questions, we're going to be bouncing around from to a lot of different verses. But eventually on the third question, we're going to settle down in Matthew 6. Matthew 6. So if you have your Bible, I want to encourage you to go ahead and open there. We're going to get there in just a second. Matthew 6. But the first question that we have is what is prayer? What is prayer? And I want to go ahead and give you a definition for what prayer is. Prayer is an open line of communication communication with God. Prayer is an open line of communication with God. As I studied about prayer this week, I saw that a lot of people simply define prayer as talking with God. And I thought that was a great definition. Short, sweet, simple, to the point, talking with God. You and I have an opportunity to talk to the creator of the universe, the one with all power, the one with all wisdom, the one that designed life and know how, knows how it's supposed to be lived. We have the opportunity to talk to that God. And that should excite you, that you get to talk to the creator of the universe. But I thought that that definition, talking with God, was a great definition, and it got to the point, but I thought that it missed one thing. Prayer is an open line of communication with God. Talking to God isn't like picking up the phone, calling him, getting a voicemail, and then he calls you back a few days later. Talking to God isn't like sending an email and three days later getting a response. You can talk to God wherever you're at, whatever you're going through, whatever you're facing, whoever you're around. You can talk to God no matter what. There is an open line of communication to God. No matter what you've done, no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're trying to fight off, prayer is an open line of communication with God. If you go to Genesis 1, in the very beginning when God creates everything, I think it's interesting to see how God, rea- or how God responds and, and works with his creation. If you look through the Bible, you know that God creates light. He says it's good, and he moves on. Eventually, he creates vegetation. He says it's good. He moves on. He creates birds and fish, and he says it's good, and he moves on. And so God creates all these things, and he says it's good, and he moves on. But what happens when he creates mankind? God doesn't just create mankind, look at it, go, it's good, all right, next. What does God do after he creates mankind? He begins to communicate with it. And so from the very beginning of time, as we as a human race were created, we were created with the intention of communicating with God. That is your, that is in your design. If you are going to be human, as God has designed you to be human, you are going to communicate with God. So prayer is an open line of communication with God. 
So now that we know what prayer is, the question becomes, why should we pray? So we can talk to God. Why does that matter? And there's a few things that we see through Scripture about why we should pray. The first thing that you need to understand is that prayer changes us. So many times we go into prayer acting like we're going to change God. We go into prayer like we're the boss. All right, God, do you see this mess? I need you to clean it up. Right? Isn't that what we do with God? God, do you, see, you need to do this, 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 and this. And we go like we're going to change God. But in actuality, what happens is when we get on our knees in true prayer and communication with God, God begins to change our heart. God begins to change us. We go, God, change all of this. And God begins to change this. Prayer changes us. I want you to think back to some people in the Bible whose lives were changed after they communicated with God. Think about these people, Noah, Abram, Jacob, Moses, David. All of these people, we know them because they're popular Bible stories and we've seen God work miracles through their lives as as we've read the Bible. But if you go to each and every one of their lives, their, their life really started when they started communicating with God. Their lives were changed forever after they had a conversation with God. Prayer changes us. Look what the Bible says in Philippians 4, 6 through 7. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Communicate to him. When you're anxious, pray. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Are you stress-filled and anxiety-ridden? Go to prayer and you can be changed and have peace. James 5.16 says, Therefore confess your sins to one another, listen, and pray for one another that you may be healed. Did you come in this place broken today? Get on your knees in prayer and you can experience healing. 1 John 5.14 says, And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. We get to walk around this life because of prayer with confidence and hope because the God of the universe not only hears our prayers, but he answers. Prayer changes us. But also prayer opens our spiritual eyes. Prayer opens our spiritual eyes. Ephesians 1, 16 through 18 says, I do not cease to give thanks for you. Paul's talking to the church at Ephesus. He says, remembering you in my prayers so that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Listen to this. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance. Through prayer, our spiritual eyes are open. As we pray, the reality of God and his kingdom become more clear. You know, we always talk about in church, man, God's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. And if we're being honest, a lot of us, when we hear that, we're like, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what I'm facing. I must be the exception because I look around my life right now and God is nowhere to be found. He's left me. He's forgotten me. He's nowhere near me. We've all been there. We've all gone through those times where it feels like God's absent. But the truth is what prayer does is prayer opens our eyes to the reality that he's right there. Prayer allows us to see him and his presence more clearly. If you're walking through life today and you feel like he's nowhere to be found, hit your knees in prayers and watch your eyes open to the reality of his presence. He's there. He hasn't left you. The truth is a lot of us are walking around spiritually uh, spiritually blind because we refuse to pray. And if we would just get on our knees in prayers, our eyes would be open to what God is doing, how he's moving, and we'd be able to see how his kingdom is being furthered. Prayer opens our spiritual eyes. But also, without prayer, you and I, we are powerless. Without prayer, we are powerless. Listen to this. Through prayer, we have access to the one who holds all power. And not only do we have access to him, but he hears our prayers and answers us. The God who is all powerful and has all wisdom hears us and answers us. 
Look what scripture says in Mark eleven twenty four. 24. It says, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it'll be yours. Power. Matthew 7, 7, ask and it'll be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it'll be open to you. Power. John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. Power. Even in Matthew 26, 41, it says, watch and pray that you may not enter temptation. There's even power over temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. A lot of us as Christians are walking around living a powerless life. Maybe you've come in this place and you feel like you have no strength to give. Like you're not going to be able to make it to the next day. You don't know how you're going to make it through the next work week. You feel powerless. The best advice that I could give you is hit your knees in prayer and watch the power of God work in your life. There is power in prayer. And we must connect to that power source or we will be powerless. You know, God, as I was looking at this point and, and studying scripture on this, God told me something. And it was kind of hard to take. But he told me, he said, Jacob, you know, my church is powerless right now. And it's powerless because it's prayerless. He said, if my church is going to get back to the power that I have for it, it's going to have to get back to prayer. And I want to encourage you, church, if we're going to see the power of God work through Marcus Point Baptist Church, if we're going to see the power of God reach and change lives, we need to be a people that are full of prayer. Prayer must be an essential part because without prayer, we are powerless. But this last point I can give you, I could have just given you this point and left it at this. Jesus prayed. If Jesus prayed, how much more do you and I need to pray? If the God-man, fully God, fully man, if he took time to communicate with the Father, how much more do you and I as mere humans need to pray? In Luke 5.16, it describes Jesus this way, but he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. That's a descriptor of Jesus. He would withdraw to desolate places and pray. Do you want to live like Jesus? Withdraw to desolate places and pray. But not only that, before Jesus' miracles, we see him in prayer. In John 6.15, before he walks on water, we see Jesus in prayer. In Luke 6, 12, before he chooses his disciples, we see him in prayer. In Luke 9, 28, before his transfiguration, we see him in prayer. In Luke 11, 1, before teaching his disciples how to pray, he's in prayer. In Luke 9, 16, before the feeding of the 5,000, we see him in prayer. And then in Matthew 26, 36 through 45, before he gets on the cross, we see him in prayer. If Jesus prayed... How much more do you and I need to live a life full of prayer? So now that we know why we should pray, if we're being honest, a lot of us are okay with those first two questions. Like we know what prayer is, we know it's talking to God, and we, we really kind of have an idea of why we should pray, but these last few questions are where we get stumped. The first one, how should we pray? How should we pray? And, and I want to go ahead and draw your attention to Matthew 6. We're going to look at verses 5 through 13. And we're going to answer these last three questions of how should we pray, what should we pray, and when should we pray. So in Matthew 6, verse 5, it says, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. Great way to start out. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask him. And then starting in verse 9, many of you are probably familiar with this. It says, pray then like this, our Father in heaven... Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
Jesus gives us a foundation for prayer. Jesus gives us a foundation for prayer, and he says, when you pray, this is where you should start. So in Matthew 6, how should we pray? We need to pray humbly. We need to pray humbly. In Matthew 6, Jesus starts off talking about, don't pray like the hypocrites who get on the street corner and they pray loud so that everyone can hear them. And so back in these times, religious leaders would literally get on the street corners and shout out their prayers so that they could impress people with their theology and people would see how smart and how good they were. Their prayers were never about God, but they were always about them. And you've got to understand something about prayer. Prayer is not about you. And I know that's hard for us to swallow, that's hard for us to understand, and yes, listen, God loves you, and he answers you, but prayer is not about you. Prayer is about God. Everything we do in this life is about God, and prayer is not excluded. And so when we pray, we come into his presence humbly because we know that in prayer, we have nothing good to bring. When we go to God, all we have to bring is a busted up, broken life. But the good news is that's all God asked for. And so we can go to the presence of God humbly. We shouldn't go into the presence of God prideful, making it all about us. Because ultimately we are the ones that are reliant on him. But not only should we pray humbly, we should pray persistently. Persistently. We just read Matthew 6 that recounts what we know as the Lord's Prayer. And if you go to Luke 11, Luke actually tells of this same instance. But at the end of the Lord's Prayer, Luke adds in something that I think it's important for us to see. In Luke 11, verses 5 through 13, it says, Then he, referring to Jesus, said to them, Which of you has a friend? And will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, Do not bother me. The door is now shut and my children are in bed with me. I cannot get up and give you anything. Right? Have you guys ever had somebody call you when you're sitting down with your family or when you're watching TV and you, you basically put your pajamas on and they call you and you look at it and you're like, <clears throat> no way. You guys know what I'm talking about? You're just like, nope, I'm done for the day. Right? This is what he's talking about. He's like, how many of you have a friend that you go to and you're like, hey, I need some some." some bread, and he's like, no, look, I'm down for the night. I'm not getting you anything. It says, I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence or his persistence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. He says, hey, this friend of yours isn't going to get up and get you what you need because you're his friend. He's going to get up and get you what you need because you keep knocking. And you say, hey, I'm not leaving until you give me what I need. I'm not leaving until you give me what I'm here for. So I tell you, though he will, or excuse me, it says, and I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find it. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, listen to this, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? How much more? You know, Billy Graham has said, he said, I believe there's a lot of answers that are still in heaven because they were never prayed for. And and I want to take that a step further. I think there are a lot of answers still in heaven because they weren't prayed for persistently. Because people gave up. Because people quit praying. If we're going to be a church that lives a life full of prayer, and if, if, if we are going to live as God has called us to, we must persistently pray. Why? Because we're so utterly dependent on him. I can't take my next breath without God. I've heard it said before that if God was to hold his breath, I'd be gasping for air. That's how dependent we should be on God. We need to be persistent in our prayer. But not only that, we need to come to him and pray sincerely. I love what verse 8 says of Matthew 6. It says, do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. 
He's like, I already know your heart. So many times what we do in prayer is we like to like package a prayer up and put a perfect bow on it, right? We like to, dear God, and then we start using these words that we don't even know. And we're like, God, look at me. I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm doing. I'm praying. Do you see me? But in actuality, God knows the deepest depths and the truest of our heart. And what God desires more than anything is for you and I to come to him with all of our baggage, with all of our mess, with all of our brokenness, and just sincerely get in his presence and say, God, here's what I've got. To my parents in the room, have you ever had your son or your daughter Or maybe you're not a parent in here, but you've had a child that you knew something was wrong with them and you knew exactly what was wrong with them. And you asked them and you said, hey, what's wrong? Your desire is for them to tell you. You don't just go, oh, something's wrong with them. I know what it is. No, like you want them to tell you why. Because when they tell you one, it shows that they love you. If they're willing to share with you what's wrong with them, it means, hey, I love you enough to share with you what's wrong with me. But not only that, they share with you, and it means, too, that they know you can help. And here's the goodness about our God. When we share even our deepest, darkest secrets and sins with our God, it communicates to our God, God, I love you, and I know that you're the only one that can help. We must go to him sincerely. So how should we pray? We should pray humbly because we're relying on him. We should pray persistently because we're desperate for him. And we should pray sincerely because he already knows our hearts. So now that we know how we should pray, what should we pray? What should we pray? What are things that I can actually pray about? Are there things that I shouldn't? Are there things that I should? And I think in Matthew 6, Jesus gives us a great foundation and example of what we should pray. And so in Matthew 6, verse 9, it says, Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. What should we pray? The very first thing that we should start off with when we pray is praise. Praise. I know what some of you are thinking. What do we sing for? To praise him. What should you be living your life for? To praise him. Everything that we do in this life should be to praise and lift up his name. Prayer is no different. When we pray, prayer is so much more than having our needs met. I I know that that is is what we, a lot of us think prayer is. I'm going to go to prayer. God's going to meet my needs. Sweet, I'm done. But in actuality, what prayer is all about is lifting up the name of God. That's it. And so when we go to prayer, we should begin by praising him. Why? Because he's worthy. And I promise you... Every single person in this room can look around their life and find a reason to praise him. Every single person in this room can can look at their life and see ways that God has blessed you and been faithful to you because that's who our God is. But I want you to know something. Even if God had never done anything for you, he's still worthy to be praised. And so when we start off our prayer, we should start off by praising him because he's worthy of it. But not only that, in verse 10, it says, your kingdom come, your will be done. What should we pray? We should pray for his will. His will. Because his way is the best way. But see, here is the scary thing about praying for his will. We never know where it's going to take us. You know, we sang that song earlier, and I talked a little bit about how when we follow God's lead, we will find ourselves in the fire. We will find ourselves in the waters. And so when we pray for his will, it can be scary. And there's a lot of us who, if we're being honest, we just don't want to pray for it. We're like, God, I've got this plan put together. It's perfect. In two years, I'm going to graduate. In three, I'm going to get married. In five, I'm going to have a kid. God, I've got this master plan put together. Don't mess it up. We say, God, here's my plan. Find a way to fit in it. Instead of saying, God, what is your plan for my life? On our winter retreat, you can ask Jeremy, there was a phrase that I kept 
praying over and over and over again, and I have zero clue why I was praying it. I told you I'm a planner. I kept praying, God, wreck my plans. That's a dangerous thing to pray. I said, God, wreck my plans. God, wreck my plans. And to be honest, our winter retreat went really like according to plan. It was amazing how smoothly our winter retreat went. But when we got back from our winter retreat, the next morning I woke up, Kenzie and I were actually scheduled to fly into Dallas and then from Dallas to Denver, and our flights were canceled. And so I was like, hold on, God. I said wreck the plans of our winter retreat, not my vacation. What are you doing? But see, in that moment, God spoke to me, and he said, you can trust me with the winter retreat, but you can't trust me with your vacation. In every single area of our life, we should pray that God has his way. Because there's no better way than God's way. Verse 11 says, give us this day our daily bread. We can pray for our physical needs. Ain't that good news? We can go to God and ask God about things that we're facing physically and he will answer. Pray for our physical needs. Give us this day our daily bread. If you're, if you're walking through life and, and Man, we went skiing, and I don't know about if you guys have ever been skiing, but I was hurting after I was going skiing. It's okay for me to pray and say, God, I'm hurting. Please heal me. It's okay if you're, if you're sitting down every night with your family, and you're looking at your finances, and you're like, God, I don't even know how we're going to pay for the next meal. God desires for you to lift that prayer and that need up to him. God desires to know your physical needs. And so don't ever come into prayer thinking, oh, I can't, I can't lift that up because, well, I just, God's not going to be worried about that. It's such a minor thing. God doesn't care. No, he desires to know every physical need that you have, and he wants you to lift it up to him. And that's good news because we have a God that hears our prayers and answers our prayers. We can pray for our physical needs. Verse 12 says, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. A part of our prayer should be confession. And this is where we really struggle. God desires for us to admit the sin in our life. You know, we've been talking about praise and his will. And and look, we praise him because he's worthy. We pray for his will because his way is the best way. We pray for our physical needs because he desires to use us to accomplish his will. And we pray confession because sin gets in the way of God's will for our life. We must confess our sins. You know, God's desire for you is for you to become more like Jesus. He wants to continue to take out the bad in you and take out the sin in you and put in more of Jesus in you. But one thing that I've learned about sin is that I'll never conquer my sin until I first confess it. I'll never conquer my sin until I first confess it. And it sounds so simple. Admitting my sin, that's where it starts. If you're in here today and maybe your prayer life has been stunted because of sin, start right here in confession and admit your sin to God. It starts by admitting your sin. Confession must be a part of our prayer. Verse 13 says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Jesus says you can not only pray for your physical needs, but you can pray for your spiritual needs. Here's what I love about this. Jesus Jesus is literally saying, you can go to God and say, God, I don't know how to pray. And God can answer you, and God himself can show you how to pray. You can go to God and you can say, God, there is this temptation in my life that I cannot overcome. And God can step in and he can break the chains of bondage that are holding you down. Our God desires not only to meet the needs of you physically, but to meet the needs of you spiritually. So we can go to God with our spiritual needs. We can go to God with praise. We can pray for his will. We can pray for our physical needs. We can pray confession, and we can pray for our spiritual needs. Ultimately, God is the only one who can provide. 
So that leaves us with the last question. When should we pray? And I'm going to give you a one-word answer. Always. Always. I'm going to tell you this. You need to pray as much as you need God. You need to pray as much as you need God. And listen, if there is anybody in this room has, who has gone one second of their life without needing God, I really want to meet you. Because the truth is, I can't take my next breath, I can't take my next step, I can't say my next word, I can't do my next thing until God gives me the ability to do it. I am so completely and utterly dependent on God that I need him every second of every day. So why would I not communicate it to him then? In 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, it says pray continually. Many of you are probably familiar with the passage that says to uh, pray without ceasing. And I know a lot of you are thinking, Jacob, come on, man. I've got more to do in this life than sit on my knees in my prayer closet. Like, what are you talking about? Pray always. And it's important for us to understand this. Prayer is more about the posture of our heart than it is about the posture of our body. Prayer is more about the posture of your heart than it is about the posture of your body. You can be driving down the road and your heart could be like, God, I need you. <laughs> I can't make it through this work day. God, I have this meeting ahead of me. I am not going to be able to make it. Not going to make it unless you show up. Maybe you're spending time with your family and you look around and you're just like, thank you, God, for giving me this family. Thank you for giving me this time. Man, we, we should always be continually communicating with and talking to the Father because we're ultimately dependent on him for every second of our lives. We should always pray. My favorite part about Kinsey and I's vacation, we did, we did a lot of cool things. We went skiing. We went to this 8,000 acre like ranch and went tubing. I mean, we went hiking. We did a lot of really cool stuff. But my favorite part of our vacation happened after we left. And Kinsey doesn't know this. She's in here. I haven't told her this. We actually left Steamboat Springs, Colorado a little early because it was supposed to snow on Saturday and I did not want to have to drive in the snow. That's a funny story anyways. You need to ask Mackenzie about us driving in the mountains. But I didn't want to have to drive in the snow. And so we actually left Friday and stayed in a place called Golden, Colorado before we went to Denver and flew out on Saturday. And so we spent the night at this place and we woke up on Saturday morning before we had to go turn our rental car in and we went to this little coffee shop in downtown Colorado and we got a coffee and we sat down and Mackenzie just started communicating with me. And she started talking to me about what God was doing in her life. She started talking to me about maybe some of the fears and the doubts that she had in her life. She started talking to me about you know, what she saw herself doing in the future. She started literally laying out her whole heart right there in that moment. And it was like God just slapped me on the back of the head. Because I've been preparing for this, this message, and it was like God just slapped me on the back of the head, and he said, that's it. Because see, in that moment, I felt probably the most loved by her than I ever had. Because she was willing to lay everything out there, things that she would never tell anyone to me. And you know, our desire, our desire as Christians should be to love Jesus more. That should be our desire, to fall more and more and more and more in love with the person of Jesus. And one of the greatest ways that we can fall in love with Jesus is by communicating with him. If we're going to experience being revived in 2021, prayer must be a part of our lives.